The first thing is we have to look at the recycling of water from waste. The second thing we have to look at is the removal of salt from water, where appropriate, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. And the third thing that we have to look at is the conjunctive use of groundwater. So let me quickly unpack each of those things uh, individually. The first thing that I said is, the, uh, is the, the recovery of water from waste. The city of Perth has got 1.2 million people. They recover 120 megalitres of water every day, the highest quality water you can have from sewage. I've been to the plant from the, the day it was constructed, I've been going there on a regular basis. So 1.2 million people, 120 megalitres. Now let's look at the city of Cape Town. 400 million people, sorry, sorry, 4 million people, we can, we can theoretically recover, and it's a theoretical number, there's still other little variables in there, but a, but a, but a, a back of the envelope calculation, we can potentially recover 400 megalitres a day of water from waste. So, so at the moment they're surviving on 500 megalitres a day. But no one's making any effort to recover water from waste. So we're now seeing in the private sector, the very, very first uh, efforts, uh, there's, uh, there's some, some very interesting listed companies now, um, I, I can't mention names right now, but they are, they are listed companies that are now breaking new ground. They are recovering water uh, from their own effluent streams and they're recycling it back. We're also looking at hotels, etc. now that we bring in technology in the country to do that. So that's the first thing we have to do, and that's the low-hanging fruit. And we have to do that across, across the board. The second thing is, I mentioned the desalination or the removal of salt. We're appropriate. And when I, say, when I say we're appropriate, I emphasize that very specifically. I use that word very specifically because what people don't realize is hard ten today is water insecure. You've got water in your tap right now. Uh, Katsi Dam right now is 40% full plus minus. I don't know what the exact the current figure is, but it's not, not as full as it should be. Mahali Dam is not very much better. And the reason is because we have lost our water insecurity because of the political involvement in the tendering process of the phase two of the Masuta Island Water Project. This is a serious, serious matter. So even if there's no political interference from tomorrow onwards, uh, Gauteng is going to increasingly become water insecure at least until 2025 because that's the first time that, that phase two can come online. So if we unpack that now, let's go back to a, a, a study that was launched by the Department of Water Affairs in 2006 when they were, were, were perceiving that there's a high level of salinity in the bar. So it's called the salinity study, the bar salinity study. And what they did was they, they did the highest level of science available and they said that the, the Vaal River is becoming increasingly saline and there are two reasons for this. The one is the sewage return flows into the system and the second is because gold mining has reached the end of its life that we're getting increased levels of salinity from acid mine drainage and, and abandoned mine dumps. So the, the decision made in the department in 2010 around about there and roughly 2012 they came up with the final solution that we have to build desalination plants in Gauteng to, to fix up the sewage works and to, and to uh, uh, remove the salt from the gold mining and return flows. Now this is already happening in the coal mining area. I'm, I'm working at the moment in, in, in some of these plants. I can take you there tomorrow. Some of the cutting edge technology plants where we're recovering, the, in fact, 99% water recovery at one of the plants, 99%. It's the highest that I, that, that I know of. So because this has not been done, we now have a very real situation in Gauteng that we are now increasingly going to become water insecure. So the numbers that have been put out are bizarre and absurd. I managed to elicit numbers from the city of Cape Town on the cost of desalination as being in excess of 40 rand a cubic meter. Now that is utter, utter nonsense. Because we've, heard, we've seen Carte Blanche have a very interesting story about two, three weeks ago on the Israeli option and they said they can do it for 12 rand a kiloliter. 12 rand a kiloliter. We're talking to other people, other, other South African companies, desalination companies, that can do it for the same value. And in fact, one of the companies has put out a white paper, so it's a public knowledge, a public domain paper, where they can go even below 10 rand a kiloliter by, by, by merging desalinated seawater with, with, desal, with, a, with a, a processed sewage water, with water recovered from waste. So, in other words, the number 40 is a false number. It's, it, it's, a, it's a hoax. It's a nonsense number. It's a, it's a smoke screen number. So we've got to overcome that thing. We've got to make a serious decision about it. But then the second number that's been put out is 14 rand a, a, a kiloliter for groundwater. Now I'll tell you, that's, we're talking about Cape Town now. And I'll tell you why that's a hoax number. Because they don't yet know what the yield is of each aquifer. They know what the theoretical volume is of each aquifer. They don't know how many boreholes they need per aquifer. Therefore, they don't know how many pumps they need. 
Therefore, they haven't yet established all of the, uh, all of the, the necessary legal things to get your, uh, your pipes across someone's private land. You know, you've got to pay them compensation. You've got to get this uh, registered in the deeds office uh, as a, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? As a, I'm looking for the third. Uh, sorry, as a, as a servitude. As a registration of servitude. And, you know, these things take time. And because you don't know how many pumps there are in a well field, you don't know how many servitudes you have to register, you don't know what the quality is, therefore you don't know what's going to be treated, therefore you can't say that it's 14 rand a cubic meter. You can't say it. So I would suggest to you today, before all the cameras, that that 14 rand a cubic meter for groundwater is probably closer to 25, and that the real number for desalination is probably closer to 10. So that's the reality, and we can only do this if we have an honest conversation about the strategic value of water. And now for the first time we see what it means not to have water. Water as a disenabler. And if you go back to what's happening in Cape Town right now, the iceberg, the iceberg that is that is hold the Titanic. Uh, if, if people were squabbling a while ago about the relatively low cost of, of, of infrastructure for desalination, what is the cost to the economy now, to job creation, to loss of investor confidence, to the tourism trade? What is the cost of not having that there? So ultimately, it comes down to that sense of So just to wrap it up, I think this new paradigm of abundance has got to be, in my view, part of the, uh, of the, way, uh, the way ahead. Uh, we've got to start talking about this thing of the creation of new water. We've got to start talking about things like the Marshall Plan to literally kickstart the economy. And it's water as the great enabler. So just to quickly explain why, why the, 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 the dams in the upper reach of the rivers are not full. Because there's a thing called a resource water quality objective, an RWQR. RWQ, uh, Resource Water Quality Objective. And the Resource Water Quality Objective is a, is a hardwired system management rule. And it says that at the barrage, if you get water, if you get salinity above a certain level, measured as TDS, total dissolved solids, there's no, there's no option but to do one of two things. You either take the salt out of the water or you dilute the water, or you dilute the salt by putting more water into it. Because we're not taking the salt out of the water, therefore all we can do is put good quality, clean drinking water to dilute it. That's why your Cuxi dams are full. And this is our strategic storage that we need for buffer during the next big drought. So this is a serious matter, yeah, but you have to understand why, why it is so. Not, it's not the fact that we don't have water in the river, it's the fact that our assurance of supply, our, our backup is, is going. I, I spoke about desalination inland. It doesn't mean to say that we must desalinate everywhere, wherever we go, because desalination does come at a cost. But personally, as a professional, I don't see any future for Richards Bay, for Itaquini, Durban. I don't see any future for East London, Port Elizabeth, or Cape Town without desalination as an option. Simple as that. And why is that so? Because each of those places are on the bottom end of a river that has been sucked dry by all inland users. There's nothing left. All that's left in those rivers is highly polluted, effluent, and bad, bad water. So if we want to be serious about uh, and, uh, 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 this, this Pakisa thing, uh, 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 oceans economy, we've got to understand that we need the, the ports, we need the harbors, we need the, the, the coastal cities to work. So desalination has to be part of our strategic planning going forward. Uh, on the conjunctive use of groundwater, the conjunctive use of groundwater is best exemplified in the case of Perth, when we go back to Perth now, where they are taking water from sewage, they're treating it to the highest standard and they're then banking it in the ground for 25 years. 25 years for the next generation, they bank it. Now that's long-term strategic forward thinking. But the clever thing is that because the aquifer is confined, there are a couple of really good things that you need to know about. The first thing is by storing water underground under conditions of climate change, you are protecting that water from, 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 from evaporation losses. So the water can't be lost to evaporation because it's stored underground. That's the important thing. The second thing is because you're storing it underground, if you put a molecule of water into a confined aquifer here, it might take 25 years for that molecule to come out to the other end of the aquifer to the extraction well. But the instant you put that, mo that molecule in here, you create a pre pressure differential across the aquifer that forces another molecule out there. So you're effectively creating new water immediately. And this is the, 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 the language of, they refer to as new water. In Singapore, they refer to it as new, as new water. Okay, so, 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 so that's what I'd like to say about this conjunctive use of groundwater. We have to simply go that route, but it's a geological thing. Not all parts of the country have the same underlying geology, so you can't do it in every place. You need, you need appropriate geology, and you also need a source of water to actually recharge uh, in, in, in periods of abundance.